in the CSIS regional lecture in the Pacific as a maritime, maritime region, the growing strategic significance of islands. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Gilang Kumbara, the, a researcher of International Relations Department, to give, to introduce and moderate the session. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues. My name is Gilang Kembara. I'm a researcher here from the Department of International Relations at CSIS. Yes, I silent my phone. And um, welcome to CSIS um, C um, lecture series. As you can see, I'm a bit, a bit shocked and awed to have uh, Professor Geoffrey Thiel with me next to me. You know, it's not every day that uh, I've got to chair <laughs> Professor Thiel. And actually, this is my second meeting in the past one week, so what are the odds, to be exact? <laughs> so, um, just a little brief of introduction, if I may, as the CSIS lecture series, it's our third year of convening these lecture series, and within this um, initiative or program, as you may see, we invite prominent thinkers and also uh, individuals into CSIS to share with us their thinkings about um, the future uh, topics, or if not, um, issues that are currently faced by the region, the country, and to an extent, the whole world. And with me, um, this afternoon, Professor Geoffrey Till will be explaining to us, um, if I may quote his title, as you may see in front, the Indo-Pacific as a maritime region, a growing strategic significant of islands. Now, I suppose most of you here are not here to listen to me ranting all day long, and I know that since we have about, um, about one hour or so until the three, um, I better get ahead and um, start, first of all, me introduce a little bit of uh, Professor Till. Um, Professor Geoffrey Till has been associated with a various number of institutions, uh, notably with the United States uh, Naval War College in Virginia, with uh, King's College, if I may, and also um, his presence here is associated with the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. So uh, it's good to have you back in um, Asia, Professor. I think we've, uh, it's a place that we really long for you to have. And I suppose without further ado, if I may now um, give the floor to Professor Till, please. Yep. Hello, everybody. Um, islands and developments in maritime power. I'm going to talk about this as a general issue. Um, but one that's particularly relevant, it seems to me, uh, to the Western Pacific uh, in particular. Okay then, let's start. Next one. What are the drivers of maritime power, maritime strategy, maritime thinking? I think it's affected by many things. Some of them are permanent and some of them are transient, like shifting patterns of trade. These change from year to year, decade to decade, and they have an effect on what navies do. Foreign policies and the international context changes as well. You're going too fast. Can we go back? <laughs> I'm not going to speak that fast. Um, foreign policies and technological change have an impact as well. Uh, but some of these are drivers of maritime power, if you like, are, are, are much more slow acting. Uh, they're largely fixed. Um, if you look at the Western Pacific, for example, it's clearly a very maritime area. Um, there are crucial maritime dependencies, critical importance of trade, critical importance of marine resources, fish, oil, gas. It has many straits and islands that are coupled with ongoing jurisdictional disputes about who owns what and what that ownership entitles them to have and many have considerable geostrategic significance. And much of this argument particularly applies to islands and what comes with islands. So why? Um, can we next one? And uh, next one. Sorry, we went all the way back again. Next one. 
Next one. Okay, resources. Wherever they are, they confer marine opportunities and valuable resources. Okay, right. Um, and quite clearly, this is a major focus of concern for many countries in this region, as it is for many others. Because islands, by definition, tend to be remote from the center of government, their orderly control um, can become important performance indicators for the political regime of the time. Next one. As if you look at, let's say, Britain's reaction to Argentina's seizure of the Falkland Islands in 1982 as an example of the way that they become symbols of sovereignty by which governments might rise, might fall. And the significance of this in current controversies in the East and South China Sea, in Northeast Asia, and of course the status of Taiwan, Hong Kong even, is, is obvious. Next one. Next, yeah. So you look at that, uh, uh, an old picture of Fiery Cross, and you can see that this is a kind of official statement of sovereignty. These guys don't represent a strategic threat to anybody. They're probably wondering what they're going to do when the tide comes up. But these things matter. Next one, please. Um, people get involved in these issues, and so it links the fate of little bunches of rock like that with the rise and fall of governments. Next one. Additionally, they have a direct military strategic value as well. Perhaps as staging posts for military forces moving from one area to another, such as Singapore has been for the last several hundred years, or Ascension Island in the Atlantic, or Diego Garcia now. They also confer a strategic advantage uh, in their immediate area as what I call strategic enablers. They become fortresses in their own right and depending on their position they can facilitate access to the open ocean. They can make it easier to conduct military operations in their region such as for example the southern Kuril Islands that Russia took from Japan makes Russian SSBN, nuclear ballistic missile firing submarine, operations in the Sea of Okhotsk much more secure. You can say exactly the same thing about the new fortresses of the South China Sea, which make it much easier for China to monitor what's going on and in peacetime to control what's going on in their immediate vicinity. Their strategic value in a war, however, much more um, debatable. Next one. Because, and I want to emphasize this point, islands can be a source of military vulnerability as well as a source of strength. It's determined by how securely they're held. Britain's loss of Singapore in 1942 is a very good example of the way that an island, instead of being a strategic benefit, um, in a way became a strategic disadvantage. The further away from the main seat of military power of an individual country um, the islands are, the worse the danger. Their strategic value, in short, is partly determined by how strongly they're garrisoned, how strongly they're defended, and history shows many examples of less than sufficiently defended islands falling to an unexpected attack, coup de main. So all of these are what I would call near permanent geostrategic characteristics of islands. So how might they be affected by those temporary and changing features of the international context that I mentioned before? Let me give you some Atlantic examples, not examples in this area. Next one, please. Uh, particularly the impact of technology. 
You look at the Azores, for example. The Azores were crucial as a way station on the way across the Atlantic in both directions in the age of sail. But in the age of steam, they were largely irrelevant. If you look at the strategic context, an island's fortunes can rise and fall. Consider Iceland, for example. In the First World War, it was strategically irrelevant. It really didn't matter. Well, hardly at all, anyway, because of its remoteness from the major scene of action. But it became very important in the Second World War, in the Battle of the Atlantic. So important, in fact, that it was invaded first by the British and then by the Americans. But taking the story of Iceland further on, just to demonstrate how critical the strategic environment can be. During the Second World War, it was crucial, as I said, and that importance carried on through the Cold War, when it was heavily invested by NATO, the United States, um, throughout the war until the, cru the, the Cold War finished. And then with that complete change in the international context, nobody bothered anymore. Everybody left. But nowadays, with an uptake if, of tensions between Russia and the West, everybody's coming back to Iceland. The Americans have moved in again. It's become much more important to NATO. So you see this constant relationship between a permanent geographic feature, an island, and a strategic context. And I would argue that these days, changes in the technolo technological and international context having a kind of effect that makes islands much more strategically significant than they were. For military reasons, quite apart from the extra marine resources, oil, fish, gas, and the rights over ocean spaces that their ownership confers. So let's explore this a bit more with looking at, no, that's, that's it, no, back, 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 that's right. Um, technology. Let me have a look specifically at the way that technology is having an impact on all of this. The effect of autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, the internet of things, cyber, hypersonics and space, all seem to be pointing at the evolution of uh, integrated battle systems of which fleets or surface ships, uh, submarines and sea-based aircraft are just a part. Next one, please. If you look at this American version of, of, of this, you can see that it contains all five domains of war, la sea, land, air, cyberspace, and space itself. The point is that many of these elements are land-based and jointly held. Next one and jointly held with greater army and air force involvement than ever before. And this alone makes Ireland much more important in determining the future balance between sea control and sea denial. <laughs> Additionally, next one, all of these battle systems inevitably link back to the defenses of the mainland. Consequently, the risk of unwanted escalation that would turn on a possibly isolated scuffle over a bunch of rocks into a full-scale war is much higher. And this in turn increases two things. It increases the value of the fait accompli, of the quick, sudden, definitive move of aggression on the one hand, and of the need to defend your islands against such an attack on the other. Moving on to the context. Yeah, the next one, please. Moving on to the context, again, of great power competition in, um, in the Western Pacific and the growing impact that that has um, on the importance of islands. The correlation of force has quite clearly changed. 
American maritime dominance of the region is much less secure than it was. And this is creating all sorts of questions about what um, might be the long-term and the short-term uh, consequences of, th of this. We're seeing a, n a new um, re-emergence, if you like, of, of great power competition. And again, more players. Next one, please. More players engaged in, in, in the process as well. And by this I mean South Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, India, um, Russia, European countries, all getting involved in affairs in, in, in this sort of region because the ocean is one, because they're affected by what's happening in this particular part of the world ocean. So that means that military planners throughout the region, and in, in fact outside it as well, are facing with all of these sort of complicating effects of the new strategic context. And because they are really by their very duty bound to be pessimistic, they take what's often known as the worst case analysis. They make the worst case, the most pessimistic view, the basis of their preparations because it's their duty not to take risks. So there we are. That's a sort of general survey of, of the problem of islands in the region. So I want to go now to be a bit more precise. What effect is all this having on the behavior of navies and on their consequences uh, for peace and security in this region? In this region. For all these reasons, I think it's hardly surprising that the focus of much strategic concern at sea seems to be shifting away from open ocean operations to much more contested, literal, even archipelagic environments in the Western Pacific. And I want to make that point by pointing at a few indicators of the way in which navies are reacting to these challenges in what I would call an archipelagic sort of way that, of course, is directly relevant uh, to Indonesia, Philippines, and so on. The first one, please. That's Malaysia's, um, one of Malaysia's two submarines. It stands, if you like, as a reminder of the fact that many <coughs> of the smaller navies in this region are developing the technologies of sea denial, or what they hope is sea denial at any rate, enthusiastically taking on new technologies which have the promise of narrowing the gap between the great and the small, of having a disproportionate effect, if you like, on the freedom to operate of even much larger navies. Malaysia is one example of that. I suppose probably the best of all is Vietnam, which quite clearly is producing a submarine fleet, a land-based missile fleet, which is designed to um, give it more options, let's say, over what it regards as its interests in the South China Sea. Talking about China, one seeing a series of fortresses being built in the South China Sea, and this creates, if you like, a way of thinking about maritime strategy in the Western Pacific, which quite clearly is centered on uh, islands, in particular the first and the second island chain. This particular version of Chinese maritime thinking, I have to say, is more American than Chinese. But in identifying where the first and the second island chains are, it does make the point very strongly that those islands in those two chains are strategically right at the heart of any possible great power competition uh, between the United States and China. I'm not in any sense saying this is likely. What I'm saying is that this is a duty of naval planners in both countries to assume that it's likely. So, what do those first and second island chains do for China? 
They first of all sketch out, if you like, two different areas. The one closer to China, uh, an area of denial, where any hostile forces would operate at extreme risk. Uh, the outer area between the second and the first island chain is less risk, but still risky. It's about trying to deny access, um, whereas in area, the area denial area, at least according to the American version of what the Chinese think, um, it's about operations of any sort whatsoever. So this allows China to entertain realistic hopes of what it considers to be its ability to fend its legitimate interests in the Western Pacific against other claimants and against strategic rivals. It allows for much greater levels of supervision and possibly control over the whole area. It would also make it much easier for its fleet to venture out onto the open ocean beyond the island chains and would make it much more, make much more secure other naval operations that it might wish to conduct inside the island chains, such as the operation of its SSBN force, um, both in southern waters and in northern waters in that region. And allied to this is a substantial growth in its interest in the future of those two island chains and its substantial growth in its capacity to project power further and further away from the mainland. So those are the, an example of one of the fortresses in the South China Sea whose very existence in peacetime allows for a much closer degree of monitoring of what's going on, a kind of inbuilt natural advantage that comes from proximity to the area of concern. At the same time, it's designing a fleet that's capable of operating much further afield. Next one. That's the famous first carrier uh, they've built, and that's the second one, uh, the Shandong, uh, which appeared a few uh, days ago. If you ally this kind of thing with uh, the growth of a very substantial marine force for the first time in Chinese history, in the acceptance of the idea of having foreign bases, as in Djibouti, for example, you can see some very radical and revolutionary developments are taking place in Chinese thinking about naval operations that kind of reflects and underlies uh, the importance it attaches to islands and to geographical features in its particular area. Let's look at briefly at Japan. Next one. Japan's case is an interesting transition from a country that used to be in the early post-Second World War days almost exclusively concerned with very narrow concepts of maritime self-defense to getting broader and broader interests. And these days, I think what's most characteristic of Japan is again a preoccupation with islands, not just its own home islands, but also the Ryukus stretching down there uh, towards Taiwan. <coughs> Japan is well aware of the potential vulnerability of those islands and of their importance, if you like, in kind of blocking out China from access to the open ocean. Much the same observation can be made about Taiwan, by the way. So, not surprisingly at all, you're again seeing a radical shift of opinion into the idea that perhaps a marine amphibious force um, ought to be engaged in and developed, even though it may represent a bit of a shift in the way that the Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which restricts them to self-defense, is actually uh, interpreted. So what we're seeing in Japan, again, is new ideas that focus on islands, that focus on the defense of islands, and preventing anybody else, if you like, taking them by surprise, and designing a fleet 
that's increasingly focused uh, on being able to secure that capability. Next one. So what we're seeing is the appearance here in, well, that's a heli, that's a aircraft carrying destroyer, according to the official terminology. It looks awfully like a small aircraft carrier to most other people. So it's the same capacity to project power further away uh, from the homeland um, happening again. It's a development, if you like, that's new to Japan since the end of the Second World War. Australia, very interesting case. In Australia, the growth in China's commercial and naval presence, particularly in the islands of the South Pacific, has caused strategists to argue that the Australian mainland is no longer strategically remote from the tensions of the region, if it ever was. Now, some people suggest the country should concentrate its resources on forward operating military forces that make the most of the archipelago of islands that once were considered part of an air-sea gap between Australia and the regional developments that might threaten it. Hence the very noticeable increase on the Navy's developing high-quality warfighting capabilities that will enable it to operate more effectively in a very possibly non-permissive archipelagic environment at some distance from home. Next one. So, although this map doesn't specifically show it, it does show the way that islands and the distance between islands becomes, if you like, the centerpiece of strategic thinking. Rather than what fleets are doing on the open ocean, rather than on trade, rather than uh, on maritime crime and, and lower level threats to maritime security. This is becoming, if you like, the focus of events. Next one. So, not surprisingly, what we're seeing is, again, a navy that's specifically designed to put into effect that kind of archipelagic thinking. These are the, the Navy's two new Canberra-class amphibious warfare vessels, which can land up to 900 troops and operate a variety of rotary and fixed-wing aircraft, including the F-35B uh, fighter. Most likely, these will operate as part of joint task forces. Again, that emphasis on joint, because this is a context, a, a geographic context for operations closely associated with the land, with land-based systems and land-based air forces involved as well. That would include the new Hobart-class air warfare destroyers and in due course, Hunter-class anti-submarine frigates. Rejuvenated Collins-class submarines will provide an extra ring of protection for such task forces being supplemented in the long term, maybe, by the future 12-strong attack-class submarines. And the whole force is going to be sustained by new generation supply vessels. So the Australian Navy is planning to go further afield and putting a great deal of emphasis on developing task force capabilities that make the best use of all three service domains, land, sea, air. And illustrating this, the Navy recently conducted exercise Talisman Sabre, the largest amphibious assault conducted by Australian Joint Forces since 1945. This also involved forces from Canada, Japan, New Zealand, the United States and the UK. In lower key, but the same kind of principle, the same strategic interest is being shown in the islands of the South Pacific, with the reopening of the old base at Manus in Papua New Guinea, and the procurement of the Arafura-class ocean patrol vessels, OPVs, which are much larger and much more capable than the Armadale-class patrol boats they're replacing. All this costs money, it costs effort. It's an indication of strategic priority, in other words. Australian defence spending 
has now increased to very nearly 2% of GDP and is expected to rise still further. The government has also heavily invested in the idea of developing what it calls sovereign defense industry, mainly through a continuous build program. And all this exemplifies the high strategic priority that Canberra now attaches to forward defense amongst the islands to Australia's north. Much the same can be said in the Northeast Pacific, where US strategic analysts and force commanders seem likewise intent on building their capacity for what I've called archipelagic defense that focus on those two island chains <coughs> I mentioned before. This is a concept of operations in which all four services, Army, Navy, Marines, and Air, come together to exploit the strategic opportunities for maritime pressure provided particularly by the first and second island chains. Next one, please. What they emphasize, just as the Australians have, is the whole idea of integrated joint operations. Admittedly, this picture doesn't capture the role that armies have um, or are expected to have, or indeed Marines have, by their operations ashore. But nonetheless, the whole principle of integrating across those five domains uh, that I showed you earlier, I think is very evident. Producing the same kind of battle system, next one, um, as indicated here. Now this kind of thinking is not new for the Navy or the Air Force but it does represent a very substantial shift for the US Army and Marine forces, which were until recently were largely preoccupied by the very different demands of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. <coughs> Here the current idea seems to be to deter sudden attacks and prevent an adversary from trying to pull off a fait accompli against unduly weakly defended forward positions. Again, presumably on the first and second island chain. A strategy like that calls for a mix of mobile and dispersed ground forces, as well as naval forces, deployed in the area of concern, supplemented if and when necessary by agile naval, air and amphibious forces coming in rapidly from outside to contest any initial assault and provide defense in depth of strategic interests further back. The model is not new. We saw this in this region and the closing stages of the Second World War with the US forces advancing across the Western Pacific in two parallel lines, one across the center focusing on the islands, and one island hopping campaign led by MacArthur, working their way up what was then uh, the occupied Dutch East Indies. Especially now that the United States has withdrawn from the intermediate range nuclear force treaty system, missiles and air defense missile systems are likely to have a very central role to play in any such campaign, and have become the subject of angry rhetorical exchanges between Beijing and Washington already. The relatively new high mobility artillery rocket system, HIMARS as it's known, now being extensively deployed by the US Army and Marine Corps in the region, will also play a very important role in all of this, as was exemplified by their inclusion in the recent exercise Talisman Sabre that I've already talked about. And throughout, there's this accent on integration, on battle systems, which because of their access to new technology and their reliance on new technology, which reduces to some extent at any rate um, the effectiveness of human control, have a worrying possibility of spinning out of control. 
So a, a system of, of, of fighting which contained within it the seeds of human beings losing control of what they're unleashing. So my conclusions. I think we're in, like this ship, we're heading into uncertain territory, or uncertain weather in this sort of case. Um, it's dangerous ground. Next one. Notice there's a question mark, by the way. It's dangerous ground, but I, I would say that all of this may sound pessimistic, um, but it needs to be balanced against those non-strategic characteristics of islands that I've already mentioned. Their value as a source of marine resources, like oil, gas, and fish. They're growing tourist value as places to get away from it all. Their future survival, given rising sea levels brought about by climate change. All of these things push countries to cooperate over islands. But it's increasingly recognized that for all of this to prevail, good order at sea must be maintained. And this calls for cooperation between navies and nations rather than competition. So it's important to recognize that islands provide incentives for cooperation as well as for conflict. And it seems to suggest, if you put, set this against what I've been talking about, that the region's island arrangements need to be handled with great attention and much sensitivity because the present is rather different from even the recent past. And with that, I close. And I look forward to comments, questions, and what President Gorbachev in happier days used to call socialist criticism. Thank you very much, Professor Till, for that very comprehensive, also very in-depth um, explanation on the significance of islands. Now, I may not be able, and I'm not trying to attempt to try to make some conclusions or comments uh, or, or conclusion out of what your presentation is because I don't I think I will do much justice but I may understand if I may say something uh, one or two comments if I may but this has given a substantial and in-depth understanding of islands as it is and especially this is very much uh, this is very much relevant towards Indonesia as we are the largest archipelagic nation in the whole world and we've always thought, and I suppose this may have been extended towards the, Britain, uh, the British as well with the United Kingdom, we've always thought that the sea as the barrier of, uh, as our natural defense. But as history has told us more for years and decades or hundreds of years is that the greatest threat may as well come from the sea itself. And that distance is no longer much of a, a deterrence due to the capabilities of our adversaries and the te technology that they have in their acquisition at the moment. And a lot of people nowadays have said Indonesia with its oceans, the oceans on our, the Pacific Oceans and the Indian Oceans as a linchpin, you know, as a bridge and connecting. So we don't, we don't try to turn our backs anymore towards our oceans. We see it as a connector both in the positive and also in the negative substance. So in, in this sense, I understand that, as you may s rightly point it out, on how islands become staging posts. It, it signals on how states are able to supply um, whatever it is that they need to have the endurance that it has to control and exert influence, exert activities and operations from that particular area into the zone that it needs to, uh, what you may mention as area of denial and to an extent an anti-access. So I hope that short comment may be able to give it a little justice. <laughs> I, if not, I'm not going to get my money this month. <laughs> so uh, for now, I think I'm going to open the round. Uh, I'll take four. Uh, so I'll take four questions for now, two in front and also two in the back. So if anyone, I see one hand and also a uh, lady. Are there anyone from the back that wants to ask the question to Professor Till? Feel free. No, one, two. OK. So I'll start with the gentleman with the blue jacket there first. Uh, but beforehand, um, I know I may, I may know some of you, but Professor Till here is not an Indonesian, so I may ask you to introduce your name and also your affiliation uh, for justice. So please, the guy, uh, gentleman with the blue jacket there, um, you may have your question or comments, please.
Good afternoon, Professor Thiel. First of all, please allow me to, to introduce myself. My name is Jonathan, and I am a student in international relations in the University of Indonesia. I would like to ask a question to Professor Thiel regarding Indonesia's global maritime access project. Well, five years ago, the president of Indonesia introduced a concept called the global maritime axis, or some call it global maritime forum. According to Professor Thiel, how does this project probably influences on how Indonesia can raise its quality of navy and also how much strategic value that can Indonesia get from making such kinds of concept? Because Indonesia is trying to restore its identity as a naval power because in the past Indonesia has the romance of two maritime kingdoms which are Sriwijaya and Majapahit. So therefore they want to try to revive some kind of historic glory for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, please, ma'am, from the Russian mission to ASEAN. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natalia. I work for Russian mission to ASEAN. And uh, you started your lecture from an interesting point that before Second World War, islands here in the region, they were insignificant. And, well, we shall consider the only modern history of islands as a strategic shift for the region. But my question is, why are you forgetting almost 400 years of colonial wars here in the region? Because actually European powers understood the strategic place of the region of islands here much, much earlier than you are saying. Starting from 16th century, the colonial wars already started here. And well, it was the same, I would say, technical gap that led to all these wars that time. Technical gap between Asia and Europe. And why are we just dismissing all these times and starting to consider some new paradigm getting about all times? Very well. Um, there was a gentleman from my right side uh, with the, but with the, yeah, from, yeah, from, Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Agung Imam Zulhata from uh, Indonesian Defense University, Maritime and Security Program Studies. Uh, my question is, uh, we're talking about uh, how the region could be impact to the maritime security, especially. Uh, my question is, is it effective when as, uh, ASEAN country members sit together and make a, com a commitment uh, to counter uh, maritime security threat uh, in the Southeast Asian regions. Uh, as we know, uh, ASEAN uh, have complicated uh, relationship. Uh, and, and the country member have uh, different, uh, in, uh, they have no common interest. It's could af effective when they are sit together and talk about how to counter uh, maritime uh, security threat in the Asian region. Thank you. And the last one, I had a gentleman from my left side, but uh, with the glasses. Yes, you had your question, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for a very deep and thought-provoking expose, Professor Till. I would like just to second uh, the first question uh, from the gentleman that uh, talking about maritime fulcrum. Here you mentioned about uh, a very interesting thing that this is joint uh, operational. You mentioned from the Army, but I start from the Navy and then the Air Force and then Marine Force, and, 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 and uh, the last one is the Army, because we are an archipelic state. How do you foresee in the near future if, for instance, uh, we all remember that uh, with the uh, projection of uh, the Blue Navy of China, they all already built such kind of an artificial land in the South China Sea. Our concern is whether there was, uh, there was a dispute uh, several weeks ago 
in the uh, Natuna, whether there will be such kind of uh, uh, pattern of attitude from big power, not to mention China, building such kind of artificial uh, island for the strategy in the battle ground, like uh, MacArthur used uh, to do it uh, in, the, in, the, in the Second World War, such kind of rock clip uh, strategy pro, uh, to project uh, the, the, the forces towards the enemy line. Thank you very much. I'm, I, I'm Iskandar Hadrianto. I'm a, a private consultant now. We have four questions. Please feel free to answer all those four questions. Okay. Um, starting with the Global Maritime Fulcrum idea. Um, not my subject. But for a country that comprises 18,000 islands, which sits right in the middle of those major east-west, north-south supply lines, that is dependent to a significant extent on marine resources, um, it seems to me to be a very obvious and correct uh, way for Indonesia to go to try and increase the integration of the various components of maritime policy that there are um, in this country particularly. So I think the aim of, 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 of this is eminently understandable. But it, it's not alone. It seems to me to uh, reflect a general creation throughout much of the whole of the Indo-Pacific that the importance of the sea to a country's economy, its culture, its way of doing business, to its trade, and to its defenses is increasingly being recognized. It seems to me to reflect in many ways what is actually happening in China too, in India, um, and as far afield as completely other countries like Brazil, for example, are doing uh, much the same kind of thing. It's mankind's attempts, if you like, at long last to deal with what's sometimes referred to as sea blindness, an inability to recognize just how important a stable system of, a, st a stable national system for making the best use of the marine resources that are available to it actually are. So fundamentally, it, it seems to me to be um, an example of something that makes eminent strategic sense for Indonesia um, and entirely understandable that this should be a, a major preoccupation of the government. Um, the problem, of course, is that there are lots of challenges in the way in this country as there are in any other and that in many cases this is not something that can be quickly resolved, not something you can quickly solve. Countries I think there are two routes to the way that countries fully develop their maritime potential. Uh, the first is, is kind of natural, it's kind of organic. It's something that wells up from underneath simply by virtue of the fact that significant chunks of society find their livelihoods at sea. And here I give an example of the Netherlands, for example, uh, whose merchants were instrumental in shaping the way that the country thought and developed its maritime power. But this was a very, very slow process. It took decades, if not centuries, uh, for this to be fully realized. A faster way sometimes of doing it is having what in a recent American election was referred to as this vision thing. In other words, somebody in authority and with some long levity uh, actually coming up with a plan of some sort and pushing it into effect. But even this is going to take time. Uh, if you think of another example, for example, of, of Germany before the Second World War, it took at least 20 years, arguably 30 years, and maybe they never really made it um, to become a maritime power in a fully rounded sense of that word. Um, it certainly outlasted the, uh, the, the guy who came up with the idea in the first place, Admiral Tirpitz. So I think I would counsel patience 
is what's required for making the global maritime fulcrum uh, a reality in this country as in everywhere else. Uh, an acceptance of the fact that this is going to be a long, slow process. And you can't have quick results that actually make a, a permanent difference. As to the second question, you misunderstood me. I did not say that islands weren't important um, before uh, the Second World War, quite the reverse. Um, you're absolutely right. The islands and what they had were absolutely crucial to um, you know, the, the, the whole motivation and incentives for colonization, for European involvement in this sort of region. The only country I was saying that was strategically irrelevant as an island before was Iceland for one period, and that was in the, um, the early part of the 20th century when it wasn't really connected to what was happening anywhere else in the immediate strategic context. But broadly speaking, the pattern that I see now taking place in the Western Pacific has always been true of uh, most regions most of the time. Islands have always been um, a focus of strategic concern for both strategic and for um, uh, commercial reasons. So if I gave the, the alternate impression, I'm, I'm sorry about that, it's obviously a, a, a misspeaking on my part. It's certainly not true. Uh, what you said is absolutely true. Um, the third question, which is the balance struck between what you might call maritime security with big, uh, big letters M and S and small letters M and S. In other words, it's a balance between hard security and soft security. This is always difficult. Um, it's always difficult for every country because in many ways, it, see, the soft security things that are cheaper to fix they're not more difficult, they're not easier, they're just slightly cheaper to fix if you, if you engage in it. And by doing so, you do appeal to the immediate commercial interests of the maritime interests that you're protecting. The problem with hard security preparations is that it's a lot more expensive, it's a lot more dangerous, it tends to be more, more controversial, and it takes much longer. So there is a tendency to in peacetime when things are sort of ticking over okay to focus on the immediate concern of the day-to-day -day business and to rather neglect the longer term issue of uh, strategic um, vulnerability and strategic concern uh, later on. And obviously the answer to your question is, is fundamentally to be able to strike a, a correct, easy and acceptable balance between those two. But it does rather underline the point that I was trying to make in, in part of my observations that thinking about maritime futures is a comprehensive business in which you have to think about not just the naval but the much more broadly maritime interests that a country have, which I think were nicely encapsulated by the, the global maritime fulcrum idea. And then there was this last question which was about the balance between, oh yes, with China, and um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, th where China is going? It's about following the, you know, how the pattern of building artificial islands is a strategy in copying how China does in its arguments. And so whether, are you seeing Oh, I see what you mean, yeah, other, yeah. Yeah, in a sense, I, I suppose um, that it might well be that we'll see <laughs> Um, countries accepting the idea that undefended islands are not only wasted assets in the sense that you can't make as much strategic use of them as you could if you had invested in the systems that can use them as a base for monitoring what's going on, maybe even controlling from what they goes on, they can become a source of not just lost opportunity, but act, um, act, um, could be become strategically vulnerable. And I think that the example that I always quote in this case is, is, is the UK and Singapore as a classic example of accepting the strategic importance of a, an island in principle but not doing enough in practice to actually defend it against a sudden unexpected attack when times are hard. 
Um, and I think that kind of warning um, may be reinforced by what we're seeing happening in the South China Sea. And we may be seeing um, the Japanese kind of building up their facilities in the Ryukus, uh, the Americans wanting to do the same sort of thing, um, more generally around, around this whole region, in consequence of, um, you know, if it, a kind of reflection, if you like, of the Chinese model. So yes, I think that's quite possible. Brilliant. Well, that's a good first round of questions. Uh, so uh, let me open up the second round. Uh, I see the gentleman one here, another one there. I recognize the other one with the white shirt in the back and also very far left. So one, uh, let me get one, two, one is that, okay. Sorry, uh, let me stop there with four gentlemen. Um, may I have the gentleman with the batik shirt as you make? Thank you, Professor Till, for your explanation or your presentation. Uh, as you mentioned before, right now we are the ASEAN country face the multi-phase challenges. One of that is maritime security. Indonesia is not the claimed state in the South China Sea, but ASEAN country we have a cooperation, ASEAN Political Security Committee in the ASEAN organization. Indonesia, as a natural country, always make uh, a diplomacy how the ASEAN country uh, conflict with China do not conduct the war. Each country right now, they build up the center of gravity for the nation, of its nation. Indonesia, if the war happen or take place in the South China Sea, we are as a country have spill over. Yeah how we take care about the immigration, yeah? Neo, maybe you know, you know Neo. The most important thing, what do you think? Do you have assumption the World War III will happen in the South China Sea? The second one, what do you think for Indonesia to build the center of gravity? Indonesia Central Authority, critical requirement. What is the critical requirement for our country? What is the critical capability for our country? And what is the critical vulnerability if something happened in South China Sea? Thank you. Uh, may you introduce yourself, sir? May okay. I have your name? I am Brigadier General Retired Junius Lumban Tobing. Yeah. I have 15 time to U.S. PACOM, and I was the one also to set up Global Peace Operation Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so may I have the gentleman with the blue batik shirt, please? Thank you for the presentations that you mentioned about uh, the rise of tensions in uh, our region here. And uh, as we also aware that we have an unclose that agreed among around uh, 160 countries. In your opinion, is it the uh, unclose is failed in the implementation to discuss about uh, the dispute in the regions? And then uh, in the second ones, we also aware that there is two countries that uh, become the impact of uh, this dispute. First is uh, U.S. and the second one is China. So the second question, what is the basically position 
of the U.S. on this dispute because you mentioned that they right now is try to have the joint operations, but it seems is also try to protect yeah, their needs. And then, uh, if we look at also the China NAFA strategy, with their uh, strategy is uh, Beirut Initiative. Do you think this is uh, the cooperation or the confrontations? Thank you. Well, let's move on to the third one. I saw the gentleman on the back with the white shirt. Please go ahead and use the middle mic there. Hello, thank you very much, Professor Jeffrey Till, for your wonderful um, presentation. Um, I'm here to make a brief statement that what I think is Indonesia is late to the game in terms of realizing that maritime power is essential. We as an archipelagic state are too army-centric. We're focusing too much on land forces because we have a lot of domestic issues at present. Well, we are more concerned about disintegration. What do you think is necessary for Indonesia to uh, make a strategic shift in its mindset to, to make our country more of a maritime power in the country? Since in the future conflict, I think, um, Indonesia is a very strategic position because it has a lot of important strategic straits, such as the Malacca Strait, Lombok Strait, Sunda Strait, where regional trade flows through and for the archipelago. If war ever erupts, most major powers would want to control these very strategic straits. And what are Western uh, analysts think of Indonesia's role in the defense of these straits if a conflict ever erupts. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I, my name is Amanta Kotan. I am from Macquarie University, Sydney. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. And the last one, I had the gentleman on the very far left back with the blue shirt. Please come up to the mic, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor, for the short uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Christo Emanuel from Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia. Uh, I have a, a simple question. As we all know, Indonesia now have uh, what is called archipelagic sea lanes that pass through Indonesia and uh, make it free for everyone to pass that lanes. And then I want to ask about your opinion. Will that archipelagic sea lanes weaken Indonesian maritime, uh, or it will not weaken Indonesian maritime. Thank you. Very tough questions for you, Professor Till. And I think if you're able to answer all of these, there will be a position opening up in the ministry for you to advise our government <laughs> as to how we're moving to GMF 2.0. So, all yours. Thanks very much. As, especially as one of the questions also contained three que one of the questions contained three sub questions, as far as I can see. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right. Well, let, let, let's try and go through them in, in so far as I can remember um, right at the beginning. Indonesia's role in the South China Sea and is the Third World War going to start here? Um, I just want to correct if you've got the impression that I think physical um, violence on a massive scale between uh, the United States and China is likely to break out at all, and if it did, if it's going to break out in this particular region. Um, if you think, I, I, I wouldn't want you to think that that's what I conclude, because it's not what I conclude. Although it's very easy to come up with possible scenarios in which that might indeed happen, and which therefore justify naval planners, both in China and in the United States, devoting some attention to preparing the sort of capabilities that they would need should it happen, um, 
largely and hopefully and on the basis that by preparing for it, it makes it less likely to happen in a traditional sort of way. I just think that both sides clearly understand the sheer destructive effect of a major conflict over something like uh, the South China Sea um, would have for them and for everyone else in the region. So I think the disincentives about taking that final step, if you like, to go to anything that involves um, full out, full scale war um, are very strong. So I don't think we're talking about a likelihood here at all. But I would make one caveat, and that is that human beings aren't necessarily in total control of their destiny. And there is, as I said in, in my lecture, a, a worrying element of reducing the level of human agency in the control and direction of military operations. And in some circumstances, one can imagine um, this kind of spiraling out of control from a crisis, a fairly low level incident that kind of gathers its own momentum and which escapes from the control of the military and diplomats. This is not a new danger, of course. Historians would argue that that's how the Second First World War started, um, particularly with the concentration on railway timetables that the military on both sides uh, in Europe in 1914 had, which kind of took over um, their capacity to control events. During the Cold War era, the, when nuclear confrontation was the major concern, there were always concerns about the famous flock of geese that would appear on a radar screen and make one side or the other feel that it was about to be attacked. And we now know on looking back at Cold War experience that there were periods of, of real danger of a misapprehension of what, what was actually happening. But in all of those cases, um, in, in the Cold War era at any rate, that human agency did stop that from happening. Whether it was a commander of a Soviet submarine off Cuba who was rattled by American ASW um, weaponry, putting it too strong, but, but act activities into thinking that he had a right to use nuclear torpedoes, but deciding with his second in command that he wouldn't do that. Um, whether it's that narrow, um, I, th I think um, human agency, if you like, did help protect us against that. But whether it can continue to have that effect in an age where decisions, key decisions, key strategic decisions are made in microseconds um, by a kind of relationship between humans and machines, I'm just not confident. And I do worry about that. So I think if the Third World War does start in the South China Sea, I suspect that it will be largely because of that kind of agency or absence of human agency rather than deliberate design on anybody's part. But let's hope not. Certainly I would argue that the, the, the classic logo of the newly reconstituted Second Atlantic Fleet in, in, in the United States preparing to fight so we don't have to remains the overarching dominating thought, I think, on both sides, uh, China and, and the United States. Then there was a the question about UNCLOS. Has it failed? And there's a sort of question hanging on that. Should we have another one to try and address uh, the issues that are left ambiguous? Um, and what, 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 it, what is the position particularly of the United States on the South China Sea issues. Um, I'll answer that second question, well, sort of say something about, if not answer, that second question and then go back to the question of, of, of what the next move is. Um, I think the, the, the broad outlines of American policy on the South China Sea are pretty well known. Um, they take no position on who owns what in terms of features. 
Um, they do take a position on what that ownership entitles the owner to, uh, and that's freedom of navigation, if you like. Um, and I think they are aware that in broader, grand strategic terms, there is a change taking place in the correlation of force, as the Russians used to say, um, between China and the United States, which is bound to have some kind of consequence. And, you know, there are, there are kind of issues involved in how the United States makes that transition. And the general view, and I'm, I admit that I'm generalizing uh, very, very broadly here, is has been traditionally, at any rate, the hope that the common interests that bind the two countries economically and strategically, as I've just said, by avoiding war, um, will try and avoid the famous Thucydides trap, <coughs> where the rising power feels constrained to take on uh, the existing dominating one. Um, so I think it's aware of the problems, it's aware of the dangers, it's aware of the opportunities as well. And it's a kind of constant process of evolutionary process of trying to work out tactically what is the next best thing to do. And so you constantly see one step forward, one step back uh, taking place, like for example over, over the recent trade war, trade talks that, uh, that have partly been uh, resolved uh, recently. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, well, possibly you didn't hear any of that. Well, you probably didn't lose anything, but... <laughs> sorry about that. You should have reminded me earlier, really. Um, anyway, so basically I, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't think there's anything very remarkable about what the United States has. I think it's in a basic sense of strategic uncertainty about what is the best thing to do, how to handle this new sort of situation um, in a way that um, it's been... Un it's a new problem for the United States. Um, and I would argue that there's uncertainty in China too about how to handle this ma major kind of transition. So, has UNCLOS failed? Um, basically, um, you, you know, the easy answer is to say that um, China signed UNCLOS but doesn't obey it. The United States didn't sign UNCLOS and does obey it. Uh, because broadly speaking, that, that's, that's, that's true. Um, in terms of the United States observing the common law that was the basis of the, um, the, the UNCLOS agreement in the past. The idea of having another UNCLOS to try and resolve the final ambiguities in things like freedom of navigation of warships and other countries' EEZs and all the rest of it is frankly a prospect that fills me with dread um, because it's likely to lead to bad feelings, endless negotiations for decades if past experiences anything to go by. I think really probably the better answer is to try and work with what you've got and where you do have differences of interpretation to try to ensure that those differences of interpretation don't exceed um, you know, what's sensible um, in the way of conducting particular events. Not a very satisfactory answer, but it's not a very satisfactory situation. Uh, the same questioner raised the Belt and Road Initiative, and did I see this as competition or cooperation? I think my short, simple answer is yes. I see it as both. It's both of those things. Um, yes, of course it's cooperation. Yes, of course it's all about connectivity. Um, yes, of course it's going to be win-win to a large extent uh, for everybody involved in it. But at the same time, it's also going to become competition. Um, it's also going to be about the win-win, not necessarily being equal on both sides. So somebody might win by 90%, the other person might win by 10%, but it's still win-win. So everybody's going to do better out of it to a greater or lesser extent, um, but to a lesser or greater extent. So there is an element of competition. There is an element of in increase of, of continuing differences in economic gain that come from all the sorts of deals that are involved um, in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, as we've seen it so far. And one set of worries that's been raised about it, of course, is the lack of transparency, um, the opaque processes, the dominance of some of the big 
Chinese state-owned enterprises in many of the deals that are made. And that leads to two possible reactions. One is to say, we'll have nothing to do with it. Um, we will set up our alternatives instead. The second um, response is to say, well, we should get involved in the process just in order to investigate what's going on and to be able to maybe influence the pattern of future events. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years or so is China doing at least some rethinking of some of the details about the way the BRI has worked under pressure um, from people who are involved inside or closely observe it from outside. So the Belt and Road Initiative is here. It's um, both comp competitive and cooperative. I don't think it's entirely restricted to the Eurasian landmass either. Um, it does seem to me to be uh, also heavily engaged in the Arctic um, and in South America and in Africa. This is a global phenomenon. And whether anybody's got total control over everything that, it, that, that is involved in it, I rather doubt. I think to an extent the Chinese are making their mind up about it as they go along, just like anybody else. Um, then the third question was about Indonesia again, taking us back there. Um, making the point, I think, um, right from the word go, um, that Indonesia is coming rather late to the game of getting full appreciation of its maritime potential uh, accepted. And I think that's broadly speaking true. Um, I think for very natural reasons uh, over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years or so, day-to-day -day preoccupations on the land side have distracted um, Indonesia from its um, maritime potential, if you like. And the questioner asked, what's necessary um, for us to actually do that? Well, I, as, a, as somebody coming from outside, I'm hesitant to say it, but I do think that the one thing that's really maybe key is what you might call persistent leadership. Um, it, it seems to me that there is a tendency in the past of the media to assume that a country can become maritime or much more maritime almost overnight. And that is completely untrue. All historical experience suggests that this is a process that takes a very long time. It needs patience and it needs persistence. Um, so I would worry if the global maritime fulcrum idea kind of dropped out of the, the priority list of the government at any stage, if it got sidetracked by some other kind of preoccupation, because I think that would undermine its long-term prospects of success. Uh, the last question, if I understood it again, is about archipelagic sea lanes and will it weaken Indonesia? Well, no, I don't think it will. It, it, it seems to me that broadly speaking, for rather the reasons I was trying to su suggest, the simple geographic position of Indonesia, um, east, west, north, south, which means that it, it sits right in the middle, the fulcrum, as you might say, of um, a whole web of um, sea routes, means that Indonesia, if it only it, in, it properly exploits its potential advantage, is, a, is in a very strong position. Um, provided that, of course, that it has the capacity uh, not just to claim jurisdiction, to, but, but to be able to exercise it. Um, and not knowing how many fishing boats are stealing how much of your fish um, seems to be a classic indication that you're not quite there yet. Brilliant. And um, since we're just about to run out of time, we have the last uh, uh, segment for question. And if I may, I'm just going to have to reduce from four to three. So I have the lady there, and uh, by Janet, of course, and but you're the last. So may I have the lady to my right, um, please? You, may, you have the first round of question.
Good afternoon, Professor. My name is Casta Rosheda. I am student at Maritime uh, Maritime Security Department from uh, Univers uh, Indonesian Defense University. So my question is: um, As we know, Indonesia is the largest uh, the largest archipelagic state, and with its blue economic interest and uh, as we already know, in the ongoing dispute uh, in Natuna waters, so showing uh, its desire for peace in Asia Pacific region. So, with Indonesia's potential through its uh, global maritime fulcrum, um, could transform Indonesia uh, into a maritime regional power. So, my question is um, called. Uh, Indonesia's pragmatic approach to settle the dispute peacefully could prompt or change the uh, the, stra the strategic the maritime strategic in Indo-Pacific region. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, um, please, Ma Janet. Um, thank you, Gilang. Um, Professor Till, uh, thank you very much for your lecture, and it's very it's such a pleasure to meet you again. I believe I last the last time I met you was during the Inter International Maritime Security Symposium organized by the Indonesian Navy, the first or the second I forgot. I asked for your autograph for my book. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, I well, okay, we had some amazing questions, but actually I was really interested when you mentioned that you have concerns that we are moving towards lack of human touch in deciding micro, if I quote you, microsecond decisions. And I find that very interesting because now we are really moving towards more arti in the development of artis artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, autonomous. I think, it, I, I believe even China, I think there was a publication mentioning that China is moving really towards integrating machine, man and machine in terms of not, well, decision making and the battlefield. So I have, my question is really simple. Do you think that you have, are there many that share this concern? Because, you know, having more influence and, the, you know, um, yeah, influence of machines in some of how we make decisions, especially when it's, you know, conflict or possible conflict or crisis. Is that your concern only or do you see more having it and are doing things to prevent that? Thank you. Thank you, Bajanet. And lastly, pa. Thank you, uh, my name is Irwan. I'm from uh, National Resilience Council. Uh, I, was, uh, I was triggered by your, 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 your opinion regarding the, the moving from uh, baseline to the uh, archipelagic thinking. Uh, you know that uh, within, ASEAN, within ASEAN, there is a polarization, some countries uh, pro to Beijing, some countries pro to Washington, the, and the others try to be uh, independent. So uh, in two decades, I think, uh, the ASEAN has enjoyed a uh, conducive environment. So the countries of ASEAN uh, seem to put it the second, the second opinion, the second uh, uh, interest to to build their, 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 their military uh, powers. But uh, in recent years, we, we, hear, we see that uh, the Chinese, by, uh, backed by their, their, their economic and technology, starting to, to, to claim unitary the nine days line. Uh, it said that uh, back or not, we have a right historical climb to this, this area. Meaning to say that uh, the ASEAN countries, you have the four ASEAN countries have the overlapping claims to the uh, uh, Sparta Islands and two another countries, Chinese and Taiwan. But Indonesia is not part of that. But this, this issue will become, become happen again in the future. Not, not this, uh, just recently, not two or three years ago, but maybe next month, maybe next year. So, my question is, Professor, do you think that uh, it is time for, uh, for uh, one of the countries as in Asia to start building uh, like a trilateralism cooperation, maybe uh, maritime uh, democracy between Indonesia, India, or Australia? They have a middle, middle, middle power. 
not not only to 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 try to balance the the the, the Chinese uh, uh, projects in power, but also to to build their, their 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 military technology. That's all. Thank you, sir. Brilliant, straightforward questions. Just one more round before we go to tea yes. break. Stra straightforward questions. My goodness. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. The first question. First of all, um, I think. Again, I, th I feel in a slightly strange position being a, a, a sometime visitor to, to this region and then pontificating about what countries in it should do. This isn't in my natural theme at all. Um, but it, it does seem to me that um, Indonesia does have a natural weight in this region uh, that could have Im an impact if properly directed at the whole response that the region might have to the situation it finds itself in. Um, I'm not talking about anything as crass as leadership of ASEAN or anything of that sort, but it does seem to me that the first step for a country in Indonesia's position is to have a very clear idea about what its policy is uh, for a long term um, in regard to maritime jurisdiction disputes that are undoubtedly happening in its region and so on and so forth, and particularly about the capacity to have some ability to defend its interests. I, I, I draw a distinction between a country being maritime and being a maritime power. Being maritime means that you have dependencies, that you have interests at sea, but it doesn't mean that you're in a very strong position to defend those interests, should they be threatened by anything or anyone. Being a maritime power means that to some extent you can defend your maritime interests. And it seems to me that the first step in this process, and as a justification for the whole of the uh, global maritime fulcrum idea, is that Indonesia does need to define what its plan is to decide what its aim, its message, its vision, if you like, of its relationship with the sea should be, and then to be in a position to do something about advancing that, to turn policy, in other words, into strategy. And they're two very different things, not just to have a policy but no capacity to implement it, policy turning into strategy. And it seems to me that over Natuna, over the South China Sea dispute, over relations with um, between China and the United States and Indonesia, the same thing applies. The second question was, um, oh, I'm doing it again, aren't I? The, the, the second question was about um, technology. And I think if you look closely at, at what, what the incentives for going this way are, you'll see that the arguments for them are apparently irrefutable. Um, take, for example, hyper, the advent of hypersonic missiles, something that presents a threat to a ship or a submarine or whatever it is that's very, very short and gives very little time for the responder to actually retaliate, microseconds. So in that sort of situation, there is a very natural and understandable tendency to actually find recourse in technology itself is to give the missile certain sets of algorithms, which means that it can recognize a threat before human beings do and re responds automatically. Now that kind of reduces human agency in that sort of situation. And it also, so that, that's one kind of thing that's pushing us in that direction. Another, of course, is, that, is a concern about loss of life. One of the big attractions of autonomous systems, for example, means that you can get all the dull, dirty, and dangerous, as the Americans call it, jobs done by machines. So you don't send people into hazardous situations. You save life, in other words. And that's a thoroughly laudable aim. But for those autonomous systems to actually be able to cope with uncertain environments that they find themselves in, there's an tendency to make them think so that they can respond to what, you know, you, you, 
they, they find when they get to wherever they're going. And in, in that way too, the human control element of it gets reduced. So I think in both those ways, you can see what the attractions of man-machine learning actually are. And they're, they're hard, to, to, hard to argue against, except on this very woolly argument that somehow or other, when human beings are involved in the loop, things are more understandable and more controllable. So it may well be that the answer is legal. The answer is something we have to redefine our law about the conduct of military operations, which somehow ensures that we keep control, rather than relying, if, in, in other words, on technology doing it for us. Um, so maybe if there is an argument that we ought to be thinking about um, law a bit more in the future, that this is something that we really ought to be thinking about is the laws of conflict rather than the laws of jurisdiction about who owns what. So UNCLOS may be less important in my mind than this. So if we've got so many lawyers, maybe that's what they should be focusing on. Um, the last question was a real biggie, even by your standards, and, and this was about ASEAN and its future, um, and its future role. It seems to me that, you know, again, I, I was talking about geography as being a kind of permanent state that you, you can't wish it away. The, the mere fact of the matter is that there are 10 relatively small countries operating right on the edge of a very big one and a very big one that's kind of reasserting itself in a way that's, from the Chinese point of view, entirely natural and entirely legitimate. And that seems to me to offer three alternatives uh, for Indonesia, for all of those 10 countries, and for ASEAN collectively. One is deference. One is to give China the respect uh, that it thinks it deserves. And in other words, not to go back to the old days, exactly, but to be accommodating. Um, in, the, in the Cold War era, we Westerners used to uh, use a pejorative phrase, Finlandization, um, which actually worked very well for Finland because they had a, one of the highest standards of living in Europe during that time. They spent less on defense and they were actually pretty secure, provided they operated within certain constraints. So there's some at attractions for that kind of response. It, in other words, it's to accept the correlation of force that I, I keep on talking about, and that it's bound to have implications, that simply living next door to one of the biggest and most powerful countries in the world is bound to affect the way you behave. And just to take it, that that's what you do. That's option number one. Option number two is to go strongly in for independence. Uh, the Swedish model, in other words, to invest in defense and to invest in modern technology as much as you can um, and to act collectively as much as you can, as, as the Swedes did nationally. Um, to turn, maybe, ASEAN into a kind of watered down version of NATO uh, in the longer term. But, uh, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, this, this, <laughs> this is absolutely, um, uh, it may be impossible, but it, it's certainly very difficult to do. The third option is to multilateralize, is for countries to say in this region, well, we're not going to enter into a hostile combination against China, but we're also not going to exclude other countries from demonstrating their interest in this particular area too and where our interests coincide, work with them. And it seems to me that those are your three choices. And which one you go for is up to you. <laughs> <laughs> that last comment really makes us, has more questions than the answer, and I think we're gonna have to convene another discussion with you, Professor Till. And uh, I suppose the questions and comments um, in this room, it really speaks volume about the expectation, it's also the respect that the room has about you, Professor Till, as not just as the expert on maritime security, but perhaps to an extent, you know, 
fortune teller of where Indonesia would go within its maritime uh, policy. But on that note, that was a very brilliant, for me, a very brilliant presentation and comments and answer you made to all, everyone here in the room. And um, I'm afraid to say that since we've run out of time, we just, we just hit three o'clock, and we have to conclude today's uh, lecture series. Um, please join me to give a round of applause to Professor Till. And for uh, everyone in this room, please stay tuned. Um, please sign up for our mailing list to be updated in the future for our CSIS lecture series. Uh, we will try to have it um, at least, um, if not every month, but in the near future as well. So thank you, everyone, for com uh, coming to CSIS, and uh, hope to see you again in the near future. Goodbye.